It's uh, 1979, and Saturday morning cartoons have just gone off, and it's raining outside. And uh, my mom's friend, who had two kids at the time, two or three kids at the time, wasn't coming over to uh, take me to the skating rink that day. So I'm stuck inside. <clears throat> and uh, my stepdad and uncle, you know, hey, had comics everywhere. I've talked about it before. And, uh, so let's go in there and see what we can find now, you know. And there's a stack of new comics. My six year old self, I'm like, how the hell did this happen? How did these get in my house and nobody told me? And uh, and it was just amazing because like after reading all those Silver Age comics and the early 70s comics and stuff that was in there, the magazines and everything, at the time in 1979, these were a stack of new comics. So I'm going from Kirby and uh, Ditko and those guys all the way up now to I'm discovering you know, a guy named John Byrne. Uh, didn't really pay attention to the credits at the time that who, who drew these stories and things like that but the art was amazing and so it helped me this storyline from the Avengers I've never seen anything more ignored more forgotten yet more revered at the same time and it was to me this to me and still is the Star Wars of uh, the, uh, of the Avengers stories man because there was so much going on so many pieces fit for what Marvel had done up to this time. They were 18 years old at this time. And people who were working on these comics had grown up in comics and loved them and stuff, and they were fans themselves, man. And I am talking about the Yesterday Quest. This ran in Avengers 181, 182, and then, uh, is that right? Yep, yeah, 181, 182, then 185, and 186, and 187. And one of the and these these books, uh, yeah, these books here, uh, some of them are the originals because I've always this is one of those stories that I always pick up if I catch it cheap. This this story deserves to have its own. He should, it should have its own home, and there's so much going on in these stories, and basically to put it in a nutshell, the storyline basically is it's a retcon story. Uh, things have been happening. Uh, I guess in the mid 70s and stuff because there's not a lot of history on this in the mid 70s where I think it was Gary Conway had written it to where Quicksilver and Scarlet Witch had discovered their parents were the wizard wizard and Miss America two characters from the golden age before there was a Marvel and they were another company and the wizard was basically a knockoff of the flash um, in a yellow suit and I know I'm not the first one to put it together that he named himself after a bodily function and he wears a yellow suit. Not good. And Miss America. So it kind of made sense. Scarlet Witch looked like Miss America. The Wizard, you know, has super speed like Quicksilver. Okay, they're mutants. Whatever. Okay, but the story is so full of so much and the way that it's structured it is amazing that, that it was this was like some solid solid storytelling I think it was a guy named David Michelinie and I think I'm saying that name right I've never run across that name other than Spider-Man comics uh, a guy named Steve Grant Mark Grunewald and of course it had art with the man who's becoming a superstar John Byrne and this book was just amazing because what they did is they kind of slowly set it up and it all started like in issue 181 and I'm like this little kid and I'm flipping through this and it's talking about the government coming in uh, by the way this this book is really revered more or less kinda hot because it's got the first appearance of Scott Lang in it who became the second Ant-Man the movie but you know after flipping through this book and just being like wow it's got Wonder Man it's got the Beast it's got all this stuff um, the page that grabbed me as a little kid, it was the first time a cliffhanger had ever gotten me, was seeing the souls of Quicksilver and Scarlet Witch grabbed by this old man and put in these little marionette pup puppets and they're caged and he's reaching for his sister because he's, you know, the protective brother and they're twins, you know. As a little kid, I was like, you know, they're toys and they're old, old toys and I start digging through the stack. I'm like, I must know what's going on. You know, or how are they going to be saved? I couldn't see it because to the Avengers, Scarlet Witch and Quicksilver just dropped. And then they couldn't figure out what was wrong with them. For all intents and purposes, they were dead, but their bodies still worked. 
and somebody said, hey, it's kind of like their soul was sucked out. So there's a little kid that grabbed me. And this is where the story just gets kind of amazing because it's so so structured so well. They were showing New York City at Avengers Mansion, uh, bright and sunny. But with things that were going on after Quicksilver and Silver Witch were saved and they find out that Django Maximoff was trying to claim he was their parents also and used his gypsy magic on him. They did some great things of putting the pieces together uh, at uh, from the start. These were fans of comic books writing comics. You had they 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 ended up tying in Jack Kirby's uh, uh, high evolutionary and his his evolved beast that he had that messed with Thor. Uh, they were knights of Wendigore. He 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 fashioned them as a knights knights of the Round Table after Arthurian legend and stuff, right? And I you know the people breeders I think is what the story was. One of the first Thor stories I ever read. Well, you know, they're kind of referencing this stuff. They're trying to pull in the high evolutionary. And they put the piece together so well. But when they use the gypsy magic, Django uses his gypsy magic. He, you know, he calls upon totems of that magic. And he calls upon the toad and the bird and the snake. And he pulls out these characters, Nighthawk, Princess Python, and the toad from the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants. And that one was when I started seeing how Marvel was a real cohesive universe because the Toad was in the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants. Quicksilver and Scarlet Witch came from the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants. And by God, he did something horrible to my little six-year-old brain because I just read about these two characters taking down Godzilla. I've got it up here in this top shelf. But he actually ate Wasp and Yellow Jacket by throwing his tongue out like the Toad he is and, and ate him. And I'm like, oh, you know. It's a big, big deal when you're, when you're a kid. You know, you're like, not them. And then they have, like I said, they had the sunny and bright New York City and Wonder Man and Beast hanging out and everything. And they end up having Wanda and Petro, Petro, Scarlet Witch and Quicksilver go to their homeland. I think they call it Transia. And you knew it was like Romania, Transylvania, or whatever you wanted to be. And they go through all the gypsy life that they have. And then they started pulling in all the things. We get the high evolutionary uh, pulled in with his stories. We get uh, a bovine. Uh, evolved that you know says he she knows him as you know it's their nanny it's it's a cow woman you know all these things that were just amazing filled in with so much some gypsy magic okay Mordred pops up so now we have our Arthurian legend we have HP Lovecraft with uh, the dark home down here you know uh, oh I can't think of the name now and all this stuff you know, so now we have magic going on. We have super science. We have evolution. We have Jack Kirby. We have throwbacks going back to the X-Men of yesteryear. And all these things were going together so well. And at the same time, as a reader, we are with Quicksilver and Scarlet Witch as they're starting to hear the real story of what happened to them when they were babies, why they were handed over, and who their real father was. And we come to find out that their father is Magneto. And by going back to the X-Men with the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants and stuff, instead of this just being some kind of hack job or, or some kind of just terrible retcon and name now that makes your eyes roll because they're going to change history in a very uh, lazy way, they took a whole they took a whole problem that they were having for whatever reason they felt they needed to do this, and they made an epic story out of it. That's how you fix things. You make a story out of it. You do it in story. You just don't acknowledge it in two, three pages. And and, <clears throat> and we've learned that Mag where Magneto is their father. When you go back and and you read those early X Men issues with the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants, there's this irony now. There's this tension now where you just want to scream at them and and yell at them that that's your dad. You know, it, it just enriched all those stories, all through a retcon that was handled very well. And it's just a satisfying comic book to read. It's just fan a fantastic story. The Yesterday Quest, go get it. Now we get to me and how this video came about. So you can stop now if you're interested or not. Okay, but these are just fantastic books. We'll just show them real quick. Yeah, I've had many issues again. Okay. And these two, you also need that one. <laughs> this is an amazing issue with a cover that does not do it justice. Let me get it out of here. Alright, Avengers 182. 
So basically what happened today is I had to go to work and I wasn't going to the office. I was going the other direction to a state hospital where I had a client. And I was just on, I mean, I was just, I just got up and I was just doing my routine and I got in the shower and I had this, this weird feeling to go grab some comics out of the blue. I don't do that. You know, I was on automatic this morning and I grabbed these books. I go see my client. I leave to go to my next meeting. And I get stopped on 81 North because of a wreck. And I'm stuck there for two hours. And I ended up reading these books and flipping through them again. And I've got this thing where I can remember where I was at and what was going on when I, you know, read a comic or bought a comic and things. And I'm filming this two weeks, you know, after Halloween. But that doesn't mean Ghosts of the Past can't come up and grab you. So I'm reading this book and I just have a flashback. And uh, two things happened. I also started remembering a few things when I was a kid, but I started seeing how this story, this retcon, may have shaped the entire way I look at comics and didn't even realize it. Because one of the things they do is that even at six years old, I caught what the author was doing in this. We open up with uh, the Beast in Wonder Man watching an Errol Flynn movie. And on a side note, this this remake of the Invasions of the Body Snatchers, one of my favorite movies, top three. I have it on DVD, and I'll watch it every couple months. But anyway, they have our two heroes, Beast and Wonder Man, watching Errol Flynn. And Wonder Man, who has recently come back to life, we'll just leave it at that, is sitting there like, he just doesn't get it. Why, why do people like want escapism? Why do they watch the movies all the time? And what they're doing is they're talking about comics. They're saying movies, but they're talking about comic book in comic book readers and he's asking you know why Beast is trying to explain to him like we're a reminder of things they can't do and that there's more wonderful things in the world out there than doing tax forms and changing diapers and they back up a little bit and saying some Wonder Man's like well come sometimes I wish I could just do that in life you know and that's, that's when I realized that there was authors who were saying things in their books you just had to look into the subtext of it and then where this is a retcon story, when they want to fix something, you know, they do it right. They do a story about it to explain it. They don't just try to do it. They retcon this retcon, I think, in the past year where due to the Marvel movies and Scarlet Witch and Quicksilver being able to be in the Avengers movies, but Quicksilver is kind of catchy for some reason, Fox and Marvel, Disney, Marvel, you know, they both had the rights to them because they've been... You know, Quicksilver's been a member of each team, X Factor and Avengers. He can be in both movies. And Avengers movies, they killed Quicksilver. Okay? In the comics, they had them go before the High Evolutionary, who told him that he just more or less got rid of him. And Magneto is not their father. And he got rid of him because, you know, they were failures because they had a caffeine addiction. Oh my god. In the yesterday quest, you had the beast who is monster-like and blue and furry. He would have been perfect in High Evolutionary's Knights of Wondegore Mountain. Knights of Wondegore, Wondegore Mountain. Because he finds a wrecked, uh, I don't know what you would call it, man, but uh, it, was, it, was, it was like a mechanical steed that, that flew, and he found uh, uh, armor of one of the Knights of Wondegore with the skeleton in it. It had been there for a while. And he puts it on and now he's a Knight of Wondegore coming in to save the day. Very epic. Our, you know, so much stuff going in there. Just so dramatic. And it was like the Star Wars of comics. So much stuff going in there. Instead of Jedis, we had wizards using gypsy magic and, and you know, Mordred the magician from Arthurian legend. and. Oh, high, high evolutionary science and mystery and who's your father, which was before Empire Strikes Back. But the other thing this thing did on a personal level, if you made it this far, is the stepdad I keep referring to in these, in these videos and stuff, I always knew he wasn't my dad. And my, my parents, they married when I was three and my mom was under the impression that she was going to be able to make me think this was my dad. As a kid, I really did not give two shits. I mean, I really didn't. Uh, but after reading that story and seeing that there's people out there, I know it's a comic book story, but it kind of like prepared me for the future in a way. Kind of opened my mind that, okay, it, not everybody has a traditional family. You know, there's some messed up stuff out there. 
it wasn't a big deal. You gotta remember, I'm six, not real heavy. So after reading this story and watching these guys find out who their dad is and everything like that, I, maybe it did play a little part on why a few weeks later I caught you know, the stepdad and, and mom in the living room and I'll walk right up and this was coming from an inquisitive mind of a six year old where you could replace this question with why is the sky blue at the time with the intensity of it. I just said, who's my dad? Right in front of him. Yet, I can honestly say I'll own it that I was a little shit because when I saw how uncomfortable it made my mother, all they would do is keep looking at me like, all you need to know is I'm your dad, I'm your dad. Well, mom's over there squirming, so I keep asking. I'm like, no, you're not. I was like, who's my dad? Who's my dad? And I'm really not expecting an answer. I'm kind of enjoying seeing my mom squirm. It's the six-year-old's got a little power for a change. Like, you know, it was purely emotional. You know, nothing was going on up here. I just reacted to what I was seeing and knew I had the cards in my hand. I ended up messing with them two more times over the years before I was 16 like that. So I was responsible. Great power, great responsibility over two other things. So years later, when I'm 18, I meet my real dad, and honestly, I reached, I just never really worried about it. Didn't, you know, the curiosity was gone. I just, this is my life. I'm 18. I'm about to go live my life. I'm a man now in my mind. It's, you know, whatever. So when I met him, I got to say, man, I think one of the reasons I just didn't get all excited or freaked out by it or anything like that was probably from exposure of knowing that there's people out there who don't know who their parents are. It wasn't the comics that taught me that. It was the comics that sort of gave me the realization that, you know, messed up things happen sometimes. So, yeah, there's a lot of history with that little story. And so this book is probably the reason that I am critical of comics. It's the reason I probably started to learn there was subtext and expected some really good storytelling. And it's got some personal ties in there and stuff, uh, you know, with some memories. So go by the Yesterday's Quest. It's a, it's a pretty solid read, man. A lot of good stuff in there. I would dissect it more, but I really think it's a story I think I you need to really just kind of open and experience and see what you get out of it. It's no Watchmen. It, don't let me hype it up. But uh, they're cheap, and it's solid, and it's good. And you'll see some stuff that Byrne ended up doing in the X-Men with the art, if you're savvy and a few other things in there. Some really good stuff. Later, guys.